All right, we're back for a, another episode of the Pair Program. Uh, your host Tim Winkler, sidekick Mike Gruen. Mike, how's it going? It's going great. Great weekend. Great week's been going well. How about you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I wanted to uh, I had to explain a little bit of a, an experience I had yesterday that kind of led me down my my pairing of something here, which was um, your know, trips to the dentist and inopportune conversations. Um, this tends to happen more than more times than not. And I, I, I'm not the type of person that's like, I hate being like awkward or rude. Uh, I have to respond yet when there's utensils in my mouth that are scraping, you know, the, 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 the roof of my mouth and like gums, um, I don't really feel like responding to the question that you're going to ask me, but it's this, funny because led on for no, no joke led on for 10 minutes to where, you know, that you should ask a question. Um, and then I would just sit there for about a minute or two and then I'd respond to the question and then she'd go right back into another question. So it was so, just like, so my mom was, would have that same problem with one of our hygienists growing up and she'd just take the stuff out of her mouth, like whatever was in there to answer the question and then put it back like that to basically show like how annoying it was. I just went to the dentist myself, um, had a similar experience. Well, had the exact opposite experience. Um, my hygienist, um, two times ago, didn't say a word, just went in there, did the job. It was great. Awesome. At the end of it, I even said, this is probably not going to sound like a compliment, but I super appreciate that you didn't talk to me at all. During- <laughs> <laughs> and she laughed. And so I made sure to get her again. And sure enough, like it was great. She just hummed and did her work and did- there was no awkward conversation. It was great. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the few times where it's like, I do not want to conversate with you. Please do your job. Um, what you got? What's your, um, what's um, your pairing? I mean, my, mine's not quite as a, as a hot take as a, as that might have been. But, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's just my, my Jewish nature. Uh, bagels and locks are always a, a, a good go to favorite of mine from a food Strong. perspective. So um, that was that was mine, um, I guess, gives uh, the dental hygienist something to do. Um. <laughs> That's right. That's right. What, what about uh, what about our guest here, Spiro? What's uh, what's uh, a couple of complimentary pairings that you think are? Uh, yeah, uh, no, that was a fun one to think about a little bit. Uh, uh, I think one is poodles and pandemics, um, <laughs> mostly because you know we just stumbled upon a family friend of ours had a farm and they had an extra poodle in January of 2020 and. Uh, Little did we know it would be like one of the better additions to the family, especially right. during lockdown. And it's a really, it's a really great pairing. Is uh, it a standard and, poodle and, or a mini poodle? Mini poodle, but she was the runt of the litter. So <laughs> she, she looks almost like a toy. Uh, oh, wow. but we love her anyway. <laughs> Pandemic poodle puppy. That's strong. Yeah. That's yeah. strong. Yeah. Mike Grove, what you got? Um, I'm inspired by Mike's food one. So I will say a, a pairing that I like is peanut butter and raspberry. Mm. Ooh. I've it's not tried that. It's an unusual that. combination, but you get the saltiness of the peanut butter with the tang of the raspberry. It, it I don't know, it hits me right there. It also takes me back to going to Friendly's as a kid. Mm. I don't know if anyone ever <laughs> remembers going that. to a Friendly's. Um, but that was my thing, the Reese's Pieces Sunday with raspberry ice cream. So I get the, oh, cho- the chocolate and the peanut butter and the raspberry all together. That's strong. So strong. are you a PBJ guy? Strangely, no. Interesting. I, I really dislike PB&Js, even though is it's based it, on the same pro- flavor profile. Is it the texture? Because I know like... Yeah. The, yeah. It's totally the texture. It gets me every time. Mm. Um, wow, that was a good session. <laughs> I actually enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that. Um, Mike, the uh, the the locks uh, situation. Are you um like you can have that at any time of day, morning, breakfast? Lunch, I usually, dinner. you know, it's a nice Sunday brunch thing. I mean, like, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it it came up because um, uh, I was visiting my parents and uh, over the break, and uh, that was served at, actually in the evening as like an appetizer, a uh, little little. So that I, I think top of mind, idea. yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, let's jump into the let's jump into the heart of the discussion here. The reason that we're uh, all together here is to dissect, um, you know, a little bit of how startups scale. 
Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of different avenues here that startups will grow. It's you know, either bootstrapped, you know, backed by a venture capital. Um, we have uh, we have Spiro here, who's got you know interesting perspective coming from leading companies underneath a uh, a holding company. Um, and so I thought the best way to kind of kick things off would be, you know, uh, maybe Spiro, just kind of starting with you, uh, a little bit of your, your background, uh, for context for the listeners is, you know, where you've kind of come from. Um, and then, uh, we can kind of jump into, you know, riff a little bit more of like, you know, what some of those pros and cons are from each, each angle. Cause you've been the one that's primarily seen it from the holding side, uh, Mike Grove, seeing things, uh, you know, from from you know pure VC backing. Uh, so I, let's let's start with you and just maybe a little bit of your background, and then we can jump into that. Yeah, no, I, I've um, been with Graham Holdings for I guess close to to ten years. Um, I, I started there when it was actually called the Washington Post Company. Mm-hmm. It uh, changed its name when it sold the Washington Post <laughs> to Jeff Bezos in like 2013. But you know, I spent like you know, about a decade under the holding company. And like prior to that, I had worked about a decade, you know, just in broad strokes for a VC funded um, financial startup. So, you know, any startups hard and challenging, uh, regardless of who's funding it, Um, it, you know, it's the same challenges, but it is kind of interesting, you know, seeing both working in like a central innovation arm for the company, but also you know, incubating an existing startup. And, you know, with Decile, we've sort of spun out a new and, you know, there's a lot just, you know, starting from scratch um, and seeing all of that under the the umbrella of, you know, a holdings company. They basically bring, you know, a bit of, I would say, like patient capital. There's still, you know, aggressive things you need to take and, and meet expectations on. Um, it's just a little bit of like a predictable cycle instead of, I'd say that like, you know, VC funding cycle, but, you know, you, you're still held to the the same aggressive timelines and the same aggressive milestones. But, you know, the holding companies broadly divide into companies that are producing cash so that they can buy more companies or invest in more things and smaller companies and startups where, you know, the cash is being used to invest in like a thesis or investment principle. So it's a little bit, you know, <laughs> being in the startup, it's a little bit being at the kids table while the cash companies are like, you know, sitting at the adult table. <laughs> but, you know, you, you do have a bit of um, a different type of network of resources. You know, VCs bring like a wealth of connections and different mm-hmm. types of resources and you have your board. And with the holding company, the same thing. There's just an element um, of being able to see, you know, such a wide variety of companies at different stages as opposed to being, you know, in my previous startup in the VC side, you're just one of many in a portfolio knowing that maybe one or two are going to make it. And, well, I uh, think that's also worth point is the, the sort of relationships between the portfolio companies versus the relationships probably between the whole, the companies underneath the holding company. You guys are probably a little more, there's probably a look, I, I, I'm just guessing, but I'm guessing that there's probably a little bit more um, camaraderie or whatever given, you know, there. Whereas with portfolio companies, I, like when I go to the board and they're like, Oh, you should talk to blah, blah, blah. It seems like it's more of a, they're doing me a favor or I'm doing them a favor type of thing. And it usually goes well, but it's not quite that same relationship would be my guess. That's a really good point. And and it's funny because you still have that challenge where, you know, you, 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 you no, no one's like forcing anyone to do anything because you're all independently held companies. Um, mm-hmm. You just happen to be owned by the same parent, but that 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 connection is a little bit stronger, and you know you see folks that you know the 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 different um, opportunities to kind of work across those lines, and and it's a little bit you know because you're all you know we're a public holding company, so you know everyone's success contributes to the the bottom line success of the company. So there's a little bit of you know a connection or a motivation that you know isn't quite the same to your point uh, with, with like a portfolio in, in a VC sense. Right. And I think like one of the companies I worked at, we um, our CEO had spun out other companies. And so we had more, you know, like there were people that we felt a little closer to because we knew them like they they knew us. We'd worked. Some of us had even worked together. So I think that and I imagine that's the same at a holdings company. You know, like you guys have probably know a number of people and, and, and continue to run into the same people. So your network just gets stronger. Mm hmm. Right. And there's a lot of cross pollinating too. you know, like if, if, um, you know, some of the, some of my former colleagues are now 
you know, heads of some of the other companies at the portfolio and, you know, other people have taken different career paths. So it's a little bit interesting because, you know, that, that's like a simple transition in some ways. So you, you, you have like some network connections that run pretty deep. Um, Mike Grove, I guess you want to like chime in on your, um, kind of a little bit of your, your con for context for the listeners <clears throat> of like your history and, and you know, yeah. where you kind of came through. Yeah. Happy to, to run through real quick. I, I came out of the University of Maryland. I went to Fujitsu Research Labs working on what we, at the time, were calling pervasive computing. We now know it as IoT. So the idea is kind of making the smart office environment of the future. We're thinking about Palm Pilots instead of iPhones. Um, but I, there's kind of the seeds of that technology. And it was all built around what I ended up building my entire career around, this idea of graphs and semantics and AI. Uh, I was there for about a year. Realized I actually had the startup bug. Did my first startup. We were kind of angel pre-seed funded in a video game industry. Launched. We made like seven dollars. Went back to Maryland. Back to doing research in kind of the area that I was in at Fujitsu. Ended up meeting the two people with whom I co-founded Stardog a few years later. Um, and you know, still around the central thesis of semantic AI, kind of graph technology all coming together. And you know, we spent a lot of time, we're a little different from a startup because we, we had a lot of years where we said, well, we're just going to be practical applicators of this technology. So before we built the product that the company was built around, we built a lot of stuff trying to figure out the way to build the product, right? right. And it, it took us about six years to see the silhouette of like, okay, that's the thing that we need to go build. Um, and, and that was kind of my transition point to kind of bring it back to the comp conversation. I built the prototypes. I built the first version. I worked on it. It's kind of my baby. And then it came time to, okay, now how do I scale this? I got to build the thing that's going to go build the thing. So that's kind of where I've been at post-funding at Stardog. So mm. I was never part of our engineering team per se. I didn't help build it until someone else was building it. Um, so that's kind of where I got to today. Um, so I think it's, a, it's led me along a little different path. To, yeah, that's interesting. I think the 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 different paths of I, even within VC world, like um, I was, you know, doing some consulting and and just sort of surprised at the the various ways. Right there's the like, well, you go out there and you sort of prove it a little bit, and you 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 get some sort of traction in the market, and then you can and you sort of and I think a lot of like at least myself, that's sort of what I always think of as like the more traditional route is like you get a little bit, and then you sort of and then you can go and say like, look, here's here's the seed of my idea. Like, you mm -hmm. know, obviously. If I could just put some fuel on this fire, we'll, we'll, we'll take off. Um, and then as I was doing more in consulting, um, especially with California companies, I was surprised at how many of them were sort of able to get, I would say, VC funding, even though they had nothing but like documents. Like there was nothing other than like some marketing stuff and maybe a little bit to indicate like, here's our business plan and this is why we think it's going to be successful. Um, and we're still able to get that sort of funding. And, um, I think it's, there's all these different ways that you can go about getting that money. Um, you know, me personally, I think it's better to sort of have a little bit more of a proven track record. Uh, I think you, the, the earlier you take on investment, the, the, the riskier it is and the sort of the, 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 the tighter the timeline, if you will, for, mm -hmm. for, you know, I think the, the investors are, are always anxious to get their money back. And so, um, you don't necessarily want to go through all the growing pains with an investor at the same time. <laughs> no, I, I wish I knew what I knew that know what I know now, six years ago when we started this journey, it is not like the books make it seem. It's not like what the movies or TV show, like mm -hmm. it's not a weird thing to have to deal with. And you're right. There's a lot of different ways to even getting off the ground. It, it was surprising when you know, we walked in with customers, we started fundraising, we had customers, we have revenue. Mm -hmm. Like, huh? Oh, kind of worrisome guys. Why, 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 is, why is having revenue? Like we've got a product, we're selling it. Why aren't you making more? <laughs> we don't have an answer. And like, and we're first timers. So we didn't know that like there was a specific answer we were supposed to give. So, you know, it took some time. Yeah. I think that's, um, I mean, what are some of the other things that like maybe some lessons that you've learned or things that you sort of wish you're, you knew six years ago or whatever. Um, well, the one thing, I got a lot of advice from people, and they usually give me like a list of 50 things. I can remember one. 
maybe three. <laughs> so like the one thing that I think I wish someone would have told me first was engineers are scared of process, right? Like you hear process, you think guys in suits asking for you to change the icon color. You have flashbacks to office space, that guy that was like Bill Lumbar that you remember from your old job. <laughs> process does suck, but at least write everything down. Like you don't have to be so rigid that oh, you got to form to do the TPS report in triplicate, but it's a hell of a lot easier. If you can do it. Man, it's in GitHub. I wrote it down. Just go follow that. All the instructions are there. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, I think that it's about, uh, when it comes to funding too, uh, having gone through it a few times, the documentation I had put together, you know, had to rush to put together for a funding round, very different, like when they're asking for it and you're like, oh crap, I didn't know that I'd have to put this together. And then like the second and third times I was like, oh, we should just start doing this now because what's going to happen is we're going to go through diligence and they're going to ask us for all of these things. And wouldn't it be nice if we weren't rushing around for them? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and sure enough, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Um, what's your what's your open source licensing policy? Like that's mm-hmm. something I mean, like maybe you don't really have to care about it too much in the early days, but when you go to get funding, that's something that frequently gets asked. And they want, you know, and they want to make sure that you're you're um I can speak to like um so we actually used to support uh Spiro's one of the one of the companies underneath the the Graham Holdings umbrella uh as he was building out the the engineering team from a recruiting perspective I thought what was unique about their uh, situation was you know startups are are always going to be a little bit more you know risky right to to pursue uh pitching this underneath the Graham Holdings umbrella underneath a, a holdings company, it's almost like you were able to pitch a startup within the comfort of a large company that has, you know, a ton of money and backing. Um, and so it was almost a little bit of the of best of both worlds. So I thought it catered well to those types of candidates that maybe, you know, wanted to, to explore or experiment what a startup environment might be like um, without the risk of, uh, the benefits might not be as appealing or they could already come in with aggressive or, or competitive compensations because, you know, it was, uh, you know, coming through a, you know, a holdings company on, on their check. So that, that was something that I thought was unique, Mike. I don't know if you're, you know, from a recruiting perspective, the, the different levels that you graduated through from, you know, angel investment to series A to series B, were there certain milestones where you felt there was a little bit more of an ease of attracting talent because of a little bit more stability or how how did that play out for you? Uh, It definitely was getting easier from the stability perspective. Just like something about having gone through multiple funding rounds, even if people had never heard of us, it, Okay, it's a startup, but they've they've been around for a while. Now the pandemic then really turned it around for us because what was our big strength there that we were fully remote? Where we were so then you know, you gotta be scrappy as a startup. Hire the best people wherever they are, be remote. That was kind of weird. So that we 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 lost that. So we see a lot more competitiveness now from that. People have more freedom to move. People can freely move. We've seen a lot more job hopping, a lot of short stints on resumes over the last 18 months and people just trying to find the thing that works for them. Um, so it's gotten harder, but it's it's gotten harder in a good way because it's made my job more focused around what's going to be the best thing for me and the employee and building like a lasting relationship that works for them and works for me. It doesn't mm-hmm. just help the company ship units. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll, well, well, I'm going to jump in because it was a point that I was making, Spiro, was about how, you know, from a recruiting perspective, you know, supporting, um, you know, in the past, like social code is the example, uh, underneath the, uh, the whole, the holdings company, it's a little bit easier to attract folks that maybe weren't as, you know, risk prone, uh, cause they had the chance to, as you spend it is like, you know, they have the ability to work for a, a startup environment within the confines of a stable backed, you know, um, uh, large organization uh, from benefits, from you know compensation and things like that. Uh, maybe your 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 take on that as you've seen it from you know maybe just pure VC versus you know the recruiting side within a holdings company environment. 
Definitely. I mean, we, we tried to sell it as you kind of get like the best of both worlds. Like you're going to get like a mature, like the things that you want from a mature company, which is like, you know, you want good health insurance and a benefits package and, you know, some robust programs to like lean on. Mm -hmm. But you also get to operate in like an early stage startup context in the sense that you're going to be working on, you know, stuff that goes straight to production. You're going to be making an impact on the mission and the business. So it, it was like something that, you know, is very attractive in the context of, you know, a startup in, in a holding company. And mm -hmm. I think that's like one thing that was definitely a, like a positive recruiting for, for certain types of folks, you know, but, you know, I think the other side of it is, you, you know, if somebody is really focused on equity, you know, you're, you're just not going to be able to offer that as um, a benefit, um, even though, you know, for, for those of us who've had a lot of experience with, you know, <laughs> like startups and, you know, the equity um, uh, attraction is, you know, both, both good and bad, you know, uh, and so I, I think there's a little bit of a, a more cash focus, I would say, um, mm -hmm. both in terms of how the holding company runs its business and sort of how it positions the startups, which, you know, it means there's a little bit more, um, you know, maybe like more patient capital, still aggressive, but, you know, patient capital. But you kind of get that like feeling of, you know, the excitement of a startup, but, you know, you, you know that you're going to get some some good resources behind you. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I guess the connections as well uh, is, is another benefit. So I'm curious on the equity side, because I, I think I think back to like the 90s when I got started. Right. And that was like the like every like equity was it. Right. Because that's where all the fortunes were being made. My first company I worked at, actually, I was lucky. It's probably the best exit I've ever had. I was a junior engineer and they went public like and, and so um, and then we got to learn about taxes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> like, oh, anyway, um, but I, I wonder, like, as the years have gone on, and we've got the the sort of dot com bubble burst, and we've sort of moved on, and and I, I do think that at least when I'm recruiting, I think equity for most engineers or most people coming into a company, um, unless they're really at those upper levels, the equity piece isn't even as as top of mind for them. Um, I think they are. I think most people these days are thinking more cash. I'm, I'm curious if you guys are seeing that. Um, Mike and, and, and Spira. Yeah, I mean, from our side, I'd say that, you know, for a lot of the folks that we're recruiting, and I mean, I guess this is true, you know, BC or not. I mean, you, you really want them sold on the mission. You want them sold that you're in the space that is exciting. But I have seen folk like we've never run into an issue um with like somebody not taking the offer because you know we don't have like an equity component mm -hmm. um and, and i think you know a lot of the other exciting parts about it and you know if you actually think about it in a mature way that you know in terms of you know your own career and financial growth like some of the same outcomes are there and at the but you know at the end of the day you need to build a company that is running a really good business and you know and the the end of, to that is is a little bit more you, you're putting a little bit more faith in the company if you will um that they're going to do right um versus like you know the what I, what I would say like you know being attracted to the option I could, but i i think there's probably a little bit of a selection bias in terms of the people that you're even seeing get to that offer stage right they wouldn't be if they if they were really interested in equity they probably wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> right. um, I'm curious, Mike, what's, what's your experience on the equity side? Yeah, it, it definitely feels like it carries a little more weight or people are at least more openly saying, yeah, I, it's a lot of ticket. I know I can't sell it. You can give me more of it, but like, are you going to let me work from home? Are you going to let me set my hours? Do I get to work on the cool project? Or are you going to stick me on bug duty detail? And am I, I going to be take off time for COVID shots for my kids whenever I want? Like, less than, like those are things that the conversation orients around now uh, and cash. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 that's my experience as well. I think the other, there's so much that people now have a better understanding of when it comes to what equity actually means. I, I, I that it's very hard to actually get paid out, especially if depending on what level in the organization you're mm -hmm. coming in at. And, um, there's all these different stages you're at too, right? Like right. the seed stage is going to be much more appealing and 
and uh, you know, probing at that equity stake versus like the Series A, Series B, you're a little bit more diluted at that point. Right, and then also the terms of whatever whatever deal got put, you know, the term sheet that was given, and there's so many different structures for that. It, it can be, get pretty complicated to try and figure out. Like, is this ever? Am I ever even going to get paid out? I, you know, like, give me the cash up front. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, so you know, I I, I think that that probably helps with a you know certain extent um when you're talking about competitive you know advantages between startup and and you know a v- traditional vc back versus say the the holdings company um similarly being able to offer um benefits packages i think i've seen the exact that sort of the opposite trend which is hr um platforms are so easy to do these days they've they've really applied some technology there that i think smaller companies when i think back to like the first company i worked at where we had one woman who was like the office manager hr doing and payroll and all the rest of it like she was spending so much time just dealing with that stuff that like the idea of offering a 401k wasn't even like an option and now Mm -hmm. you have all these different um platforms out there that just make i think it much easier for smaller businesses to offer um these types of the, those types of more mature those types of things programs that you would see at a, a more mature company. So um, I think that there's being there's less and less differentiation between those two. I'm I'm, I'm mm-hmm. curious if you guys are seeing the same thing. Sorry, I was just sort of preaching there for a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> leading the witness, if you will. <laughs> well, it's an interesting point, and and you know, I, I guess there's a little bit to kind of also what you're alluding. Once that feels a little bit more commoditized, then some of those things just become expected and some of the you know advantages of like an older company like you almost have to remind folks of some of the benefits and and they just don't necessarily register even though there may be like a cash component um you know for a while anyone joining the holding company would be part of a pension program it's like who's Mm -hmm. (laughs) who's getting a pension these days (laughs) and you know graham holdings had the unique uh you know they had a bit of an overfunded pension, if you will, um, you know, given the guidance that Warren Buffett gave them, you know, over decades. And mm-hmm. so they were in a unique position to do certain things and, and take certain actions. Um, but, you know, I would often you know, have to remind folks that, hey, you have this money sitting <laughs> in an account that you can take, you know, now or, you know, continue on. So it's it's funny along those right those lines. But yeah, the I mean, even as a startup and holding company, you're still responsible for, you know, kind of how you're dealing with everything, but it, it's becoming a lot easier. So I think there's just expectations. Um, those are just becoming the norm. Yeah. Now it's the, I, I, Mike, I'm curious, like the, the expectations, obviously you have a 401k. The question is how much do you match? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and we didn't for a little while as a small company, because it was that or hire people. Right. Like, you know, those are the trade-offs that we're making and loud and clear and voice kept saying, well, you just, we kind of assume this, this is, part of the status quo now. And fortunately, Mike, you're exactly right. We have the one person who manages all of that. And that's the only way we can do it all because the software has advanced too much. A single person manages the 401k and the health plan, which is competitive. We, Like my wife has healthcare. She's got a new job. My plan's just as good as hers. Right. Mm-hmm. Like we didn't switch. Or just as so bad, like depending startup, on who I'm you proud of to. that. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a whole different podcast. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> yeah, we actually but, just you know, I'm proud of that as a startup that we can kind of meet everyone else where where the expectations are. Right. Yeah, we actually just rolled out our uh, first 401k officially goes active next year. Um, you know, we're at 22 employees. Prior to that, we had a it was like a simple IRA mm-hmm. and just kind of winging mm-hmm. it, but um like a lot of it is there's just so much paperwork and you have to do like, you know, educate yourself. Um, so one, one of the uh, things that I've recommended to like earlier stage startups that are just kind of, you know, piecemealing things together from an HR and benefits perspective is there's these brokers out there now. I'll shamelessly plug the one that we just signed up with called Benny. They, um, they do a lot of the the legwork for you in terms of explaining not just like 401k and matching and what it means and what you're you know what you're on the hook for and um, the different regulations because uh, there's all sorts of you know safe harbor this and uh, so helping to to just break it down simplify it for you they do the same thing for you know insurance plans and 
actually walking through, you know, this is what your deductible actually means. A lot of people don't really understand it. They're just kind of like signing up for things. So um, I think there's like a lot of value now uh, since startups are, you know, so popular, these brokers that are catering to these startups and small businesses to, to help you kind of have a little bit more of the, like a feel of a more established company and, and be able to offer a bit more uh, than you once probably could. And I think they're capitalizing on a moment too. Like we had people like all over the con- country and mm-hmm. when you're in that situation, um, you know, luckily, you know, we had a lot of central support cause you know, you, you have to pay attention to every state law. Um, and you know, every mm-hmm. random situation that occurs in an HR context, you know, there, there's, there's something different either by state or by, you know, whatever the oh, circumstance. It gets, it gets more fine grained than state. I mean, San Francisco oh, yeah. and New York have their own. <laughs> anyway, don't get me started on, compl- on yeah, HR exactly. compliance. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but yeah, it is funny because those platforms, I think, really offer. I mean, you, you effectively can, can, can do a lot and offer a lot um, mm-hmm. as a smaller company now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's sort of the way technology like. If you think about how companies, how technology companies use small technology blocks to build and build and build and are able to offer more and more and build and create more interesting products and platforms, the same is also happening at a at a like a macro scale with businesses, right? Like we no longer need these large departments because we can actually find a, a platform, a company that does and that and that's all they do, and we can really rely on them to provide that great service. At a, at, that's something that's cost effective for, for us. Um, mm-hmm. It's just sort of this evolution that's just sort of happening. It's that same sort of paradigm that's just being applied again and again. Yeah, it's kind of like that previous episode we recorded with build versus buy. You know, it's like there's so many things out there from a, an engineering perspective. You could just buy this now. You don't need to hire up three engineers to to build this add on um, piece of your your software. So yeah. Cool. Well, any closing remarks, anything else that, uh, that you wanted to hit on before we transition to the next segment? Good. Cool. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, yeah, let's transition. <laughs> right. For a second, I just assumed Spiro had frozen again. That's <laughs> 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 I wasn't sure you're talking to your co-host. Tim. Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. No, no. I, for 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 the guests, anything, uh, Mike Grove or Spiro, anything else you wanted to add in? Um, I guess the only thing I would say, the topic is how I scaled this. I got a lot better at it. Just speaking from personal experience, once I realized I was still engineering, I was building a thing to build the thing, mm-hmm. and once I stopped thinking about meetings and like grooming and like all that stuff is like oh that's icky overhead it's management bs no it's just part of a a different system that's building another system and i build stuff i am a builder that's what i do that really like made it work for me and that made me more effective in my job that that was part of that getting over that engineering bias of thinking of that that stuff's icky and like the loaded background that that a lot of the stuff comes with Mm -hmm. um once i had that insight which i'm sure sure you had too mike i'm sure you as well (laughs) It, it worked better for me. I was better at my job. I was happier doing it. I didn't miss the days of being in the trenches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, there's like another piece to that that I'm reminded of, which is, you know, as you're scaling and I think you're kind of alluding to it, th- there's like a bit of, you know, it, it's sticking with you know, the, the labels come and go, like whether you're calling it first principles or, you know, staying close to, you know, the actual domain you're building in and, and like thinking about it outside of, you know, whether you're building a microservice or shared library or writing it in Python or some language, but, you know, having like that team that can really think about the problems in that context. Um, that's like where, you know, as you're scaling out, th- those types of skills become really valuable. And, you know, those are like the fun problems to work on too. I mean, you obviously need all the other stuff too, but, um, that's such an important trait. And, um, and I often find myself, you know, that's my happiest place too, is, is, is being, you know, in the crown jewels of the company, like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the parts, you know, your IP isn't whether you written it, writ, writ, written it in a particular framework or language, but it's, you know, really thinking through the specific problem your company's solving and like how, 
you're doing it in its own, you know, um, special way. And so, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think it's a good uh, good ending point. Um, yeah, why don't we segue into the um, the next piece here, which is round out my career. And this is an area where we've crowdsourced some some topics and questions from our community uh, that kind of hit on specific areas of like career progression. So I'm going to spin this wheel here, see what we land on, and riff on a couple of a uh, couple of questions. Drum roll, please. Uh, benefits, it's actually appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> How appropriate. Rigged. <laughs> it's rigged. Um, all right, this is kind of a fun one. So, what would be, what would you say is the most unique company benefit that you've ever received from an employer? I mean, I will probably go back to the one that I was most surprised about it, like just the whole pension benefit, which yeah, is, you know, just seems so antiquated, you know, it, it's, you know, the holding company's been around since, you know, the twenties and thirties. And so mm. it's just funny, but it, it's also just funny thinking about how, you know, people just used to approach their relationship to a company. Um, and even though the stats are kind of counterintuitive today, like people actually are staying at certain jobs longer, even though, you know, all the press around, the great resignation and everything mm-hmm. else going on. But um, it is funny thinking about that just as far as like, you know, a benefit that is, is a little durable. Um, They've but, certainly uh, shifted uh, just in the last two years, right? Since the pandemic, it's uh, there's some off the wall benefits that are being, you, we're seeing like benefits need to be more personalized. It's not one size fits all anymore. Um, you know, a good example is like, you, know, you used to get like a, a gym benefit, a gym membership. because so everybody's coming to the office. The gym's right, you know, downstairs. Um, well, now you know maybe seventy five percent of the team is no longer coming in to the office. So do they, do they just not get anything? Um, so we're seeing a little bit more of like almost like buffet style. Like, hey, if, you know, if you think that uh, you know personal well being or mental health uh, or nutritional counseling is something of interest to you you know we have that option instead of going physically to a to a gym um mike grove what have you what have you seen uh the exact same benefits have gotten a lot more generic just what's the point of a commuter benefit we used to do that i took advantage of it it was nice but i i don't commute no one else in my office commutes it's sitting empty um, so now it's just a generic little bit of stipend that everyone gets. So it's gone from more exciting to less exciting, but I, I think more universal. Mm-hmm. Um, so, we, you know, we've been trying to find other ways to provide some of the same culture building perks that benefits can provide, like the gym membership, like, uh, but doing it in this digital age, we had a lot of success in some of the like goofy trivia and digital escape rooms, mm. uh, you know, not benefit, but it, it got people excited and, and kind of kindled the same sort of thing as that maybe you hope for from, you know, other, other perks that you offer. The digital escape room is intriguing to me because I had somebody explain this, uh, that they offered this to their team as well. Is it literally, you know, somebody putting a, a, a webcam on their head and, and trying to navigate while everybody's telling them what to do? What they, they did, it was more like a hackathon. So you'd like hack and like code around a puzzle and like unlock things. So interesting. It was for engineers. So it was uh, okay. very engineer. Uh, so we, so, we, cool. we did one uh, uh, company where uh, it was company wide and it was it was uh, it was solving puzzles, whatever we broke up. Uh, the company just broke up into teams and it was solving puzzles and there wasn't really hacking as much as just thinking some things through and, and thinking logically and, and watching the, the dynamics as uh you know, different team members who think differently try to work together to solve a problem. Uh, right. <laughs> um, you know, this this was literally a GoPro on some you know somebody on someone's head, and the entire team just kind of watching this you know live and directing them where to go through different rooms. Yeah. As wow, a, the escape that, room. That's I have not seen that. That's Isn't that wild. <laughs> that's like escape room telepresence. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, I, it's funny because some things, you know, everybody's transitioning those things to virtual and mm-hmm. some things kind of make the leap okay. And, you know, we, we had like a trivia night and that, that was plenty fun. Mm-hmm. But then we tried doing like, 
I don't know, like these drawing things and you know some other things, and they just got way too complicated. Mm -hmm. Everyone just drew over each other's drawing. And I think one of the biggest uh, challenges is doing a virtual happy hours Uh, that has Mm -hmm. not like Mm -hmm. for large groups, like for large groups, right? Right. You just there's not a good way to be like. I don't want to hear that conversation. I want to participate in that conversation, you know, and um, but usually it's just sort of dominated by one or two voices unless you mm-hmm. set up a whole bunch of breakout rooms and get, you know, that set up a, essentially a virtual conference. Um, but I do think the trend in um, back to what Mike was saying, I think being able to repurpose some of that money that maybe was being used towards benefit, like some of these benefits like a gym membership and, and just sort of taking a step back and, and 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 trying to reuse that money for for other things um which might have more benefit um whether it's mental health or connectedness or or whatever it is just those types of programs i think um it's nice to sort of see i think you mm-hmm. know, i think there's also i remember i worked at a job where we got free lunch um it wasn't catered it was like at a restaurant you know it was a place it was always at the same place we always had to eat at california tortilla um that was as free as long as we ate there was subsidized um but that what that created was a gr- like a lunch group that would go and and do that and then at, at a different company uh there was a salad club um and that got a little i think that got a little bit of um uh sponsorship from at least the ceo who participated occasionally so um those types of things which kind of create camaraderie or whatever it's I don't think they're considered traditional benefits, but it's nice to see those types of things. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, my yeah. wife um, works for a, a startup based out of San Francisco, and they are, it's like a food tech startup, and their employees receive $15 a day in Grubhub to use or lose. And I, you'd be shocked at like, people go crazy over that stuff. And like, yeah, we're over here. We're like, hey, you know, we haven't used it yet today. Let's go ahead and hit up uh, 7-Eleven and grab some Red Bulls and honesty. Um, I mean, it's it's the type of thing where, you know, it's it's a valuable ad. So when you talk about going to the lunch, you know, the lunch uh, perk, and that could be just an alternative solution now that things are virtual. It's like, okay, well, how much were we spending per day? You know, let's just put that into a bundled, you know, Grubhub dollars per day per employee. And you know, you'd be surprised how many people really cherish that, that yeah. benefit. It's it's interesting. I remember at that company, we um, ended up, you know, went through some tough times in the dot com uh, bubble as that burst. And um, we retained that benefit even as we were laying people off. And there were and there were people like, I don't understand. You're going to continue to pay free lunch and you're not going to like, can't we just save some people's jobs? And like, let's let me show you the math on this, because mm-hmm. we could pay that engineer one more day or we could give you guys lunch. For, it's like not an expensive benefit. <laughs> <laughs> that's right and I, one other thing that i've noticed too which you know some of these things don't really cost that much money but you know everyone's cameras into each other's homes so to speak mm-hmm. and you know we had a, we have a pretty diverse team so it just even some of the things where you know we had different people share you know the way they celebrate their different holidays and what like it, it's funny it's, it's just something so simple but in many ways, some of our, you know, virtual happy hours weren't as like engaging as just somebody being able to like really authentically talk about, you know, you know, how they, you know, celebrated with their family, you know, like a particular event, you know, it's somebody to talk about, you know, day of the dead stuff and, you know, someone else talking to well, anyway, those types of things, um, you know, kind of recasting that lens. Cause I think Mike made the point, there's these things that are like, so commoditized. Like I remember, us having like remote work as like a basic, like that was like a novel job. thing. Right. Like, you know, go go back like five, 10 years. It was like, wow, that's a, that's something incredible. But uh, yeah. you know, that's not a novelty anymore. Right. Yeah. Now, 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 you know, you have to come up with something more creative than that. And we're, we're seeing that as something that we have to advise a lot of startups that are, you know, they, they think that their remote policy is, is uh competitive, but it's, you know, a hundred percent is what's the, you know, almost the norm now. So anything outside of that, you have to compensate in different ways. Um, so it's, it's completely flip-flopped from what it once was. Um, cool. Well, I think, uh, I think that's good to go guys. I want to be mindful of everyone's time and, uh, yeah, we appreciate you guys joining and, uh, you know, putting your two cents in. I think this is really valuable stuff for, 
you know, startups, or engineers, technologists, uh, anybody that's considering something, uh, an opportunity with, uh, with a startup, 